Hi, I'm Gordon Raquel from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at filmmakeru.com or follow us on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. Uh, every week, we interview a film professional to discuss their work, and this is made possible by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking needs. This week, I'm joined by Paula Wiedobro, uh, whose work includes Coda, Barry, and Fargo, among many, many, many other great films and shows. Uh, welcome to the show, Paula. Thank you very much. Um, I have to ask you about Barry, because I love that show, <laughs> particularly season two, episode five. Uh, with the little girl who's doing all the stunts and everything. Yeah. When you got the script, how did you, like, how did you envision shooting that versus how it came out? Because it looks, it's it's quite a chaotic and exciting episode, I guess you could say. I think it was, it was pretty close to the way Bill Hayder and I talk about the way we were going to shoot it. I mean, for him, he didn't want to sort of glorify violence, even though it's all about the violence <laughs> on the show. So yeah. he wanted to do like really long takes, sort of like composed and sort of like taking your time to pan across the room or like to track and to let the shot play out instead of mm -hmm. like covering it in a million pieces. So uh, we watched the apartment and... Also, Roma was like another inspiration. And yeah, Bill and I, we photoboarded the, the, uh, the episode. And then the little girl was really amazing as well. So she did a bunch of the stunts. Mm -hmm. Well, it's such a, it's a long one take of the fight between him and the father. So mm -hmm. how did you guys like that so that you can actually see what's going on when when we're moving around and seeing the whole room uh well i mean that was on stage so mm -hmm. uh yeah that lighting wise it wasn't as hard it was more the choreography of the camera and sort of rehearsing with the stunts and like filming the stunts and sort of discovering the pace of what was going to be seen and like like do some switches like from the stunt person to the real person. And like also uh, Bill Hader at some point he was wearing a mask and that was like the, the stunt person instead of him. Okay. <laughs> now, um, when you got brought on to Barry, how did you go about developing the look for the series? Well, Barry was actually my first TV show and um, they had already shot the pilot. So the look I mean, sort of the language was a little bit established, mm -hmm. the wider lenses and I mean, all the locations were picked out. And, but then after that, like you sort of slowly start making it your own. And mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, and, and the locations, they're not like beautiful, like, I don't know, like you have to embrace sort of the Burbank quality of the show and the, <laughs> like, cement and yeah. those like pinks and grays they're always muted colors for or like i guess washed out colors because the sun just beats the hell out of that area yeah so i guess it was just them like not fighting the like sort of the world of barry and embracing it okay interesting now you're also you're working on apple's uh, coda so how did you get involved with that Actually, I, I've been working with Sean for a very long time since we were both young and in film school. I was at AFI and I shot a short film for DWW, the Director's Women's Workshop. Mm -hmm. And Sean was a student there and uh, it did really, really well. It went to Cannes and, and they could sort of started a little bit her career. And then we've done other short films and we did the Talula a film with mm -hmm. Ellen Page and that also did really well at Sundance and then a TV show called um, Little America mm -hmm. and then Coda. Little America, if I'm remembering correctly, is that, uh, that's not the reality show. About no, it's, an, okay. it's another, <laughs> it's another uh, Apple show and it's an anthology yeah. about stories of immigrants in the oh. U.S. So, so it was quite nice. So how did you uh, work with the the showrunner for Coda to come up with the, the look of Coda? 
Mm, well, it, it was Koda is a it's a movie, so it was just with Sean really, and uh, we she's from Boston, so so she was really close to Gloucester, the the mm -hmm. world where it actually took place, and it it was an adaptation of a French movie, but she wanted to make it her own, and and she really took it on to learn like about deaf culture and language, and then also about the fishing community. And she had grown going to Gloucester, so she knew the locations pretty well. Okay. And is the, sorry? Oh, no. Yeah, that's it. Uh, it, was there, uh, what were some of the challenges in shooting Coda? Mm, I think, I mean, some of the challenges were shooting on, on the boat because the boat's pretty small and um, sort of it had to be three miles away from the coast and we could only have a limited amount of crew mm -hmm. and it was also like potentially dangerous so we had to like be aware of that and then also you can only fish once or well I guess you can bring the nets up but eventually the fish die so you have to <laughs> like sort of choreograph what all the shots you need and and time them and and also the actors had to learn the process of fishing, which was intense for them. Did was because like when you go on the water, there's a lot of reflections that are shifting and changing. So did that impact you? How did that how did you work with that when you... mm -hmm. well I mean I think in the ocean it was sort of slightly more documentary approach, like the cameras in the boat were handheld and like we didn't really have room for much equipment, but then we also did like from another boat, we had a crane and a stabilized head. And with that, we did like more of the sort of landscape and beautiful shots of the boat. Now, since Coda was a remake, um, did, what did you keep from the original and what did you uh, change from the original? Mm, I think it was more about the story rather than the look. I think I didn't really reference it as much for the look but um yeah i think it's like they we kept the whole tight knit family and sort of the girl having to decide about her own path and sort of destiny now when you're you know one one of the questions i like to ask all the cinematographers and and colorists that i talk to um you know where do you go for inspiration do you have lookbooks that you collect or you know, artists that you particularly look to for inspiration? Yeah, I mean, usually, usually when, when we, um, like when I interview for a movie or something, I start thinking about movies that I feel are slightly similar, either mm. story point or like the way the camera moves or the way the lighting works or sort of the color palette or the location that it's set. And then like I watch pieces of the movie or I like there's another uh, website called film grab that's pretty awesome and yeah. then yeah you can just look at stills or like even photography as well and then I mean the directors also have their own sort of inspiration and then I think it's very helpful to like reference like certain scenes from other movies and be like oh is that what you were thinking or and then from there you develop your own language and then you go to the locations and you start imagining what the actors may do okay yeah now how do you like to work with colorists then on projects uh because mm. it's become such a team effort yeah i mean i like for like i like to go and and sort of show them some stills of colors and sort of the contrast that i'm going for and then i do a camera test and then sort of like either with the actors or in the, the place or like just sort of getting it closer to the actual look of the mm -hmm. of the uh, movie or the project and then we create a lot together the, so that I can shoot and it's sort of closer to what the final thing is going to be and then we work together at color timing. Now, did you have to uh, learn sign language uh, for the set or did someone help you out with that on, on set? Mm, oh, no, luckily there were interpreters. Uh, <laughs> Sean, Sean did learn sign language because she had to speak with the actors a lot mm -hmm. more. And I guess it was taking away from 
her connection going through an interpreter. But for for me, it was um, it's a little bit more uh, basic the language that I need to communicate with them. So, but yeah, it's it's a whole process, sort of setting the scene and rehearsing the scene, and also knowing what they're saying and mm -hmm. like sometimes we would have a translator sort of narrating what they were saying on their earpiece mm -hmm. is there a, a uh like a particular photographer or artist whose work uh you really admire and have sort of go to for inspiration like um a particular cinematographer or anything mm, well i mean there's there's a lot of them i, I like sven nickvist and Chivo, of course, and Roger Dickens and uh, Benoit Devi. What is it uh, about their work that attracts you? Um, I think that they, I mean, they create a very unique language and it feels just right. And it feels like they really went deep into the rabbit hole to not do the same as other people or to make it appropriate for the project. And, and I think, I mean, I think like Roger Deakins, all his movies are so different, which I really love. Mm -hmm. What would you say, cause you know, working on an indie film versus a big show like Barry, what, what would you say are some of the, the big differences? Mm, I mean, I think, yeah, I guess you have less experienced crew and less equipment, but, and then maybe sometimes less time but I think on a movie the great thing is that you only have one director and you have usually more time to prep and like you sort of develop a closer rapport whereas in television like there's different directors for different episodes and like sometimes some are better than others or like you just have to constantly adapt to a new person every time. Now when you know you've been able to work on these amazing projects uh what would you go back and tell yourself when you were starting out like what would you uh, if, is there something you learned that you tell yourself the younger you when you were just starting out that would would have been beneficial for your career mm, no I mean I think I like you constantly learn and you're constantly improving and you're constantly telling yourself oh next time I'll do this or I'll do that but I think when I was young I was very determined and I like I got an internship with Emmanuel Lubezki and sort of approach experienced people and try to like learn from them and I think people are very receptive of younger people asking for an internship or mm -hmm. advice or and then I guess also watching as many films as you can, reading about movies. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the fun part. Uh, now you've worked uh, with a lot of directors who are also actors. Uh, how do you, uh, how does that experience differ from working with directors who aren't actors? Mm, I think it's it's a lot of fun working with directors who are actors because they they act out the scenes for you while you're prepping the movie and like I think they're more I don't know they're more I guess sensitive or they can sort of guide you into the world easier like mm -hmm. um yeah I guess they're more open and, and yeah and, I mean they're great to, to talking to the actors as well is there a particular genre uh, or style of film that you've wanted to try but haven't had a chance to? Mm. No, I mean, I love drama, but somehow I always do comedy. <laughs> well, I, I tend to do dark comedy a lot. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. I mean, yeah, I think I don't really love action or, but I, I love period, like just the usual stuff, like period stuff or more drama or more character driven. Mm -hmm. What would you say um, is the most challenging aspect of being a cinematographer? Mm, I think you always have to be focused and concentrated and you need a lot of energy throughout the day and you're always working and you're always on, like you don't get time to rest. 
because you're always like either like setting up the shot or looking at the rehearsal or lighting or like watching the shot um and i think if you're not focused you can miss the opportunity to make it a great shot but i think the amazing part is that you're always very like engaged and focused and you can always do better now um i have one last question that i like to ask everyone i interview um you know, we've been stuck in this pandemic for quite a while. Uh, and in that time, a lot of people have turned to streaming services for entertainment. Is there a show or a movie you've discovered over the last year that you think people should check out? Mm, I mean, I was watching a lot of, more, like, I prefer watching movies. I was watching Billy Wilder a lot. Um, oh, yeah. What was it about his work that you... Mm, well, I think, I mean, it's it's incredibly funny and sophisticated and like just the way he would frame or light or like block the scenes. Mm -hmm. I thought it was pretty incredible. And I was also watching a lot of Luis Buñuel. He's like quite unique and perverse and sophisticated. Okay. Well, thank you so much for letting me interview you today. Thank you. All right. And that's our show for this week. Uh, make sure to check out filmmakeru.com for our latest courses. And of course, follow us on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. Uh, again, I want to thank you for joining us. And uh, I'd also like to thank our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking needs. I'm Gord Burkell. Thanks for watching. <laughs>